So, uh, I've said a lot already about the sufficiency of God. It's kind of been a repetitive thing already. Sufficient this, sufficient that. But what does really sufficient mean? And I want to start with a definition this morning. Uh, so sufficient means this, enough or adequate, enough to meet the needs of a situation or proposed end. And I love that definition uh, because it speaks exactly to who God is. God is enough, God is adequate, and He is enough to meet all your needs and the proposed end, or a proposed end. And what do you mean by proposed end? Well, God has a plan, and it was in motion from the beginning of time. He already knew how it was going to come to fruition. And in that proposed end means that God is enough and adequate to get there. So if He has a plan in your life, if He has a purpose in your life, and you trust in His promises in your life, He's enough and adequate to get to the end of that promise, to make sure that it comes to pass, to make sure it's there. So our God is enough. Our God is adequate. Our God is enough for everything and anything that you face in life. There's nothing that he lacks. There's nothing that he can't do. There's nothing that he won't do or nothing that he will not or possibly even think can't do, right? It's a whole bunch of it right then, I know. I know sometimes people go into to, uh, the Gospels and they look at this passage in there that talks about Jesus at Capernaum, or uh, it's pronounced Caphanahum, but it's the village of the Comforter. He goes in there and he says, the Bible says that he couldn't perform any miracles. And you're like, well, didn't it say that? Well, no. He couldn't do it because of the faith there. It's not that he wouldn't do it or couldn't do it. He wanted to do it. He did some. But the faith of the people prevented any more of it to happen. Well, how did it prevent it? God can override your faith, right? Yes, because we see in the Bible that where it speaks, God, help my unbelief. The man is asking for Jesus to please help my unbelief, override my unbelief. But a lot of times, if you are not careful, the lack of faith you have will be the very thing that keeps your blessing from coming. So it takes faith in order for things to come to fruition in your life. It's not that God can't do it or won't do it, but what good is it if you have no faith and He provides it? If there was no faith that initiated it, if there was no faith that began that work, then it's just like you as a parent handing your child something without no work. It, it's not appreciated. It's not taken for what it is. And sometimes we've got to remind ourselves that we have to put in the faith in order to see the, what we believe and hope to be true to come to pass. So God is enough for all these things that He can do everything. He's enough for you in every situation. He's enough for me. He's enough for everything that comes in life. So God's enough, correct? Y'all got it? Good. So tell your neighbor God's enough. Make sure they got it. Wake them up. Good deal. So God is sufficient, but why do we act like He's not? Why does it always come to pass that Christians walk around as the most defeated people in the world? And I get you have problems. We got problems too, trust me. Uh, that's part of life. But why is it that Christians tend to show more of doubt than they do of faith? Why is it that when people come into the house of God, they walk out bro more broken than they came in? I wonder why that is. Maybe, maybe it's not because God isn't who He says He is. Maybe it's just that the people of God don't believe in who He says He is. Or believe that He can still do great things in their lives. So they walk around defeated when they're supposed to be victorious. But we forget this simple truth of God's sufficiency. We forget the simple truth of who He is, and we allow life to come in. We allow a myriad of other things to come in and chip away at what we once had as an unshakable knowledge. One time in our life, we believed in God more than anything else in the world. He can move every mountain, and then life came around and started to chip away at it little by little. And all of a sudden, the God that was bigger than our mountain now seems that He's smaller than it. These, the, so hopefully through these next three things, you will allow God to kind of twist some things around, kind of move some things within your spirit to say, hey, this is, this is what needs to change, and it's okay that it needs to change because I've got something better for you on the other end of it. So hopefully we'll see this through these three things, and ultimately if you allow it, it will rekindle or start, one of the two, something in you that will allow you to trust in Him more than anything else in your life. More than the money you make, more than the spouse that you have, more than the people that's in your circle, more than the job that you go to, more than anything else, you trust in the sufficiency of God to provide along the way in every part of your life. So we're going to look at three things this morning, and let's start with number one this morning, or you can say the first example, whatever you want to call it, but it is called the sending, the sending. And I want to, excuse me, sorry, I want you to turn to your neighbor again and say, will you go? Will you go? Okay, good, good deal. So that's the question that is part of this whole first point is will you go will you answer the call of God on your life and you're probably like well I thought we were talking about sufficiency well yeah but part of talking about the sufficiency of God is also believing that God when he says go you'll go 
So um, God, your go could mean different things. It could be your go could be answering a call to ministry. Your go could be answering to the heed of the Holy Spirit within you to go pray for someone or go talk to someone and say, hey, I just want to tell you that you're loved. That could be the simple go. The go could be moving somewhere. The go could be staying somewhere. The go could be joining a point. And the go could mean a different, many different things. For some of us this morning, the go could be just simply getting out of bed the next day because you feel like the world's crumbling around you. That could be your simple go. It could mean a, a different things for each person. The go could just be trusting in Him, whatever it may be. The, the go will take you to the next step of phase in your life, but you have to make that step. So the go is important in your life, but you will have to go, you will have to be obedient, and you will have to be faithful along the way. Will it be easy? No, it won't be. But that's okay, because guess what? We have a person, we have a God, and we have a Savior, we have a Holy Spirit, the triune God, the Trinity that is within us that will help us along the way if we trust Him. So He's with us, He's along the way, we just got to answer the call. But more times than not, the go will cause you to stretch. And we all hate stretching. Just to go back to the story that Pastor said about me and Jeremy Kirk not too long ago with running. Just so you know, I was a little sick that morning. And he's a little bit taller than I am, okay? I swear the guy's got legs that are about seven feet tall because I felt like my legs were little, little chicken legs trying to keep up with them. I know even on my best times, I'm not going to be able to keep up with them. But um, anyway, we, I don't even know where I was going with that. that going. Anyway, going back to that, uh, the, talking about the go and being sufficient and all that, I'll get to it, I promise. Give me a second. I done got lost like Pastor does in some of his stories. The stretching, there we go, thank you. The stretching, I hate stretching, and he made me stretch that morning. I, I, I can't touch my toes and my knees not bend, okay? It hurts. I, I can't do any of that. So I'd rather have pain in the running than I would at the beginning of the stretching. But oftentimes, like, oftentimes when what we face in life, we'd rather not do any of the stretching at the beginning. We just want to get started. But sometimes God says, I need you to stretch so that you'll learn something, so that you'll grow, so that the run will be a little bit easier on you. So sometimes that stretching has to happen. You see, I told you I'd get back where I was going. But just so you know, I am trying to keep up with them a little bit. Whenever, I, got, I got a little while before I could you know, maybe do that. I probably won't ever do that. That's a lot. But anyway, moving on. So sometimes that stretching has to happen. The stretching in your faith is there for a purpose. It's there that faith will grow. It's there that in the midst of that problem that you're facing, that it actually becomes good for you. The problems that you face and the trials that you face, James tells us to count them as joy because there is joy within the learning process because when we learn through the problems and the pain, we come closer to who God is in our life. And then when the next problem comes up, we can say, well, he was faithful then and sufficient then. He'll be faithful and sufficient now. So I want to show you a story in the Bible real quick. It comes from Matthew chapter 10 that I believe, if you'll turn with me this morning, um, paints a perfect, clear picture of the sufficiency of Christ and what happens when we're obedient and faithful and answer the go of a Savior. And we're going to start with chapter, in chapter 10, we'll start with verse 1, and then we're going to move to 9 through 10 because verse 1 is key. It says this, and I'm reading through the ESV version, just as a side note there. It, he, and he called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Let's skip forward to 9 through 10. 9 through 10 here, he says, Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or staff, for the laborer deserves his food. So how does this prove a perfect picture like you just said? Well, it may seem at the very beginning of this that you would think that God, or excuse me, that Jesus sent his 12 out with nothing but what was on their back. He said, take no gold, take no copper, take no silver, take no tunics, extra clothing, extra sandals, extra nothing. Just go. And oftentimes in life that may feel exactly what's happening to you. You think God's saying go and he hasn't given you anything. That he just sent them out with nothing, that they have nothing with them, that God just, is, or excuse me, it doesn't matter, they're both the same. But Jesus says that, um, hey, just go and just worry about it later. But in fact, the opposite is true here. If you go back to verse 1, and many of you have a verse 1 in your life and you just don't realize it, you're just clouded by the fear and the doubt that you forget that what God has already put in you and given you. So verse 1 says this, he called them. And he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal every disease and affliction. I love this because first he called them. And you've got to understand, when you read the red print, or anything in the Bible rather, because it's all God breathed, 
that when God speaks, it's power. God spoke in everything in existence simply because He said it. So when Jesus says, I have called you, He is speaking power in the calling. And when He says, I have called you, that is enough for you to continue to move forward despite Him saying, don't take nothing with you. So for some of you this morning, you're like, well, maybe this is leaning towards more of you talking about somebody called to ministry. But no, everybody's called. Some of you have been called to death to life, and you just need to answer the call. Some of you have been called to do something great, and you need to answer the call. Some of you have been answer, need to answer the call out of, out of the deepest, miry pit that you find yourself in. Whatever it may be, you need to answer the call. Christ didn't send them out with nothing. He sent them with a calling. And that's enough. The calling on your life, whatever it may be, you may be called to go preach, then go. That calling is enough and sufficient to get you there by one single word. To me, I think about this when I think about the word calling. God called me by saying live. And when He said live to me, He told my dry bones to come alive. He told my iniquities and everything within me to cease and go away. And He told me to get up and move forward. Simply because He told me to live. So maybe the, the word in your life may look different, but He's called you. And the second thing He did is He gave. He gave them something. So it may look in 9 and 10 that He sent them out with nothing, but in fact He gave them authority and power. So not only did He call them, but He gave them authority and power to do all the stuff that He needed them to do. Now granted, they were going out just to preach to this, this new stuff to the Jewish people. We find later on in Acts that the Gentiles will begin to get uh, the Word of God to them. But right now it's focused on them, the Jewish people. But He gave them the power to do this stuff. So when you are called and He has spoken into your life, He has given you authority and power by simply speaking to you. Because you're answering Him as a child of God. So this morning, many of you need to realize that even though that it seems like God may have sent you out on this journey with nothing, in fact, He sent you out with everything you need. Because what's so cool about this is that we find at the very end of verse 10, it says, for the laborer deserves the food or his food. Well, what does that mean? That means when they went out and preached the gospel and it impacted somebody's life, what happened then is that person would begin to support them. Because that support, they wanted someone else to know about the gospel. So they would support the disciples. So they would stay in that house. They would do church in that house. They would feed them. They would clothe them. They would do all this stuff for them so that someone else would get what they have just received. And what happens there is you see that in their obedience, they found their sustainment. What you think that God sent you out to do, which was just to go and God, you didn't give me nothing, man. You tell me to go out and just well, what's on my back. But God's saying if you just be obedient, you'll find your sustainment. And many of us this morning are sitting on the cusp of being obedient and wondering where our sustainment is. And God's like, until you go, you won't find it. The church has to get up and go to find the sustainment. You've got to get up and go to find the sustainment. You've got to be obedient and faithful to a God that will be obedient and faithful. It's not a question if He will sustain you. It's a question of when you will receive it by being obedient. And I love that about them because they go out and do that and they find sustainment through obedience. They had all they needed to begin with. They had all of it. And then along the way, they were supplied, just like, you, like us as a church. We supply the tithe and the offering so that the gospel will go out. You see it at the beginning of the Bible. You see it all the way through the Bible, the sustainment of God through the people that he's preaching to or the people that the word's going to. So we get to band together, whether you preach, whether you do anything on point team or not. If you just give or tithe, you are part of the ministry. It's a little side nugget there for you. You see the sustainment of the people there. But how does all this apply to you? How does this prove the sufficiency of God in face of your mountains and your valleys this morning? Because it's one thing for me to be up on stage and tell you all this great stuff, but until you actually ingest it and take it and do something with it, it won't really make any dip in your life. There won't be nothing that happens until you allow it to affect you. But how does it do that? Because just like the disciples, you as a child of God this morning have been given everything you need. If there's somebody in here that doesn't know who Christ is, there's a Savior who is knocking at your door right now and is pulling on those heartstrings that says, hey, I have something that is sufficient for what you've been searching for. You know, I don't have to search anymore. I've got you. Just trust in me. So your obedience... Your faithfulness to what God says be the go in your life will, your, will find sustainment through that. Your sustainment will be found in that when you answer the go and be obedient in that. But why are you allowing what was supposed to be a stepping stone become an immovable mountain in your life? What was supposed to be a faith booster has now become a faith killer in your life 
All because you have forgotten that you have all you need already with you. You have the sufficiency of God in you. You have the, the, the ability to trust in it. The solid foundation of who Christ is is right, residing within you. You have forgotten the sufficient love, the sufficient power, the sufficient provision, the sufficient forgiveness. The, everything about Him that is sufficient for you, you have allowed worldly things, you have allowed the mountain that seems unmovable to get in the way of what He's already spoken to you to be true. But you went on this journey thinking you've been given nothing. But I, 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 this is, I know this is going to be kind of funny leading to something serious, but it's okay. When I was going over this message with, uh, in my house, I wasn't by myself. I had my two dogs with me. And it was so funny when I was going over it because I, I go over my messages before preaching to myself or my pets, whatever. I have to go through it because if I don't go through it, I won't find the mistakes or what I want to change or what needs to change. But they were like, what the heck is going on, dude? What are you doing? But I felt it then and I, I felt it this morning. But there's somebody this morning that, God is trying to tell you that He's enough. There's a person in here this morning that has been questioning everything around you. And God is speaking to you this morning and saying, I'm enough. I'm enough. And I, I can't really explain why I feel that or why I felt that then, and, but I just know that there's something within somebody that is making you doubt the sufficiency of God. And the great I am... It's saying, I am enough. And you just need to accept what he says. Because I love, that, I love when he tells Moses, I am that I am. In other words, that I am enough. I am your provision. I am your love. I am your forgiveness. I am everything you need in your life. The great I am is. And somebody needs to answer the call that God is saying deep down in you. That is saying, you have been running for the wrong reasons. You have been searching for all the wrong things. And you have been wondering when something would change. And I'm giving you an opportunity to do it now because I am sufficient for you. And you need to answer that sufficient call to you this morning. But if that's not enough for you, if this example of what happens in Matthew chapter 10 is not enough, I want to look at David's life. I preached on David a while back because David's just a, a great man of God. Uh, he's a God after man's own heart. And he has many things in his life that reflect us every day. His issues, I read a psalm not too long ago that was a lament about what he had done with Bathsheba and to Uriah, her husband. And uh, it was a lament to that. And it shows the, the, not only the deepest, darkest despair of David's heart, but also his looking for forgiveness and then accepting that forgiveness and moving forward. So David's a great man. But David was the eighth son of Jesse that Samuel saw. We all know seven's the number of completion. So he saw seven sons, and, and Samuel was like, no, nah, this isn't, this, I, need, I need another. And I preached on how everybody's got their eighth day coming, your, your number eight's coming, which is a new thing, all that good stuff. But, uh, but David shows up after being in the field, and uh, Samuel says, that's the guy. He anoints him, the next king of Israel, puts God's anointing on him, his power rests within him, and he's sent back to the shepherd's field. He's sent back, and one day he goes to deliver food to his brothers. And what turned into a delivery of food began a delivery of a nation. So not only does that speak something volumes because God will do something extraordinary in your ordinary if you allow him to, simply by heeding the call to go, you'll be surprised at what he'll do in your life. But he goes and he sees the Israelites all lined up and they're like, he's like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine mocking our God? What are y'all doing? Why y'all, what are y'all doing? And he answers Goliath's challenge, I'll fight you. So he goes in. I'm, getting, I'm going to get to look side about this guy. I love this part. He goes in and he goes to Saul's tent. The anointing on Saul has already been lifted and put on to David. But what we see Saul doing is trying to put on David his armor and his sword. And David's like, I can't, I can't wear this. this. This isn't working for me. And some of you are walking in here day after day, Sunday after Sunday, and people are putting on you something that was never meant for you, and God's got a fresh anointing on you, and you need to rest in that. You need to rest in that. Saul had an anointing, but God said, I'm done with this because of your disobedience. Now I'm going to put a fresh anointing on this man. And many of you are trying to live out an anointing from somebody else on your own life, and it ain't working. And it's time for you to accept the anointing that was tailor-made for you. Too many times people walk around trying to live off of mama, daddy's, grandma's faith. And God's trying to say right now, i got something fresh for you. It worked for them. It's not going to work for you because it wasn't meant for you. It was meant for them. So you've got to get back into your own anointing and then allow yourself to go forward in the sufficiency of God. So 
Many of us are allowing something to be put on us that wasn't meant to be put on us. You're trying to say, that worked for that person. Man, you see his faith, you see her faith. I want that faith, so now I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make sure I have that faith. Whatever book they read, whatever conference they go to, whatever they do, I'm going to do that because I want what they got. And God's sitting there like, I've got something far better for you. It's working for them. Let me work in you with your own anointing. So some of us got to answer that. And what's so important about this is that David knew that he had already been given what he needed. He spent the time in the sheep's field learning to be a shepherd of sheep so he can be a shepherd of a nation. He killed the lion and the bear, which means that if my God got me through the lion and the bear, that means my God will get me through the giant in front of me. So David already had what he needed. All David had to do was trust in what God had already provided. Much like the disciples that were sent out with the calling and the gift of authority and power, they had to believe in what Jesus had given them to be enough to sustain them for everything that they came to. David's life is a mirrored point of that. So what David did is David believed in what God said. God put me in the shepherd's field for a purpose. I learned not because I'm a Benjamite, but because of what I've done there. I've learned how to use a sling. So you know what, Saul? You keep what you got. God's gave me a fresh anointing for me. I'm going to go use it. I'm going to grab these five smooth stones, but I'm only going to need one. I'm going to kill the giant. I'm going to move on. Because he knew that God had given him what he needed. He was sufficient. All David did was be obedient and faithful to the call to go. And he he went, and then look what he did. So many of you are facing that go. Many of you are facing that that time where you need to just get up and move. And God's saying, if you'll just be obedient and trust in what I've already given you, which is just the word from my mouth that promises you that everything will work out for my glory and you're good, just trust in me, move forward and go, and you'll find your sustainment. And somebody needs to move forward this morning. If not everybody in here. I know I do. There's a lot of stuff in my life that i got to say, okay, God, I trust you. I'm going to move forward. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it's going to show. I don't know how I'm going to make it. But I know you've given me enough to make it possible, and I'm going to trust and be obedient so I find my sustainment in the moving. So, David was obedient. The disciples were obedient. Now the question is, will you be obedient? So why haven't you moved? Why haven't you moved forward? Why haven't you gone forward? Why haven't you accepted the anointing on your life? Why haven't you stopped putting on things that wasn't meant for you? Why not? Why haven't you moved forward? That's a question you'll have to answer between you and God. And many of you probably already know the answer. Many of you probably already know that there's something blocking you. That there's something in the way. And it might be just you. You may be blaming it on many other things, but it may just simply be you. You can keep blaming it on everything else, but maybe it's you that needs to change. Maybe it's you that needs to stop doing some stuff. So trust, rely, and He is sufficient for your every need. Because one thing about God is His tomorrow for you is far brighter than the tomorrow you have for yourself. Because He could give you something that you never could give yourself. And He continuously gives every day. My mercies and grace are made new every day. So God said move. Write that in your notebook or in your mind. God said move. Will I move? God said, move, will I move, and will I find my sustainment? Yes, I will if I move, however you want to put it. The second thing this morning I want to talk about is the manna. And we're going to go from the New Testament to the Old Testament. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 16. We find God speaking to Moses here. He talks about the quail. He talks about the manna. He explains why he's doing it. And uh, we're going to focus on 13 through 15 this morning. And it says this, In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was a face on the wilderness of fine uh, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw, they uh, they said this to one another, What is it? And the cool little thing about this is, is that what is it in Hebrew kind of sounds like manna. So that's where they believe the word manna came from. So what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is bread that the Lord has given you to eat. It is bread, has given you, uh, bread that the Lord has given you to eat. So a little backstory of this. The Israelites have been grumbling. If you know anything about the Old Testament, the Israelites, that's what they tend to do. Uh, God's chosen people, seen miraculous signs all day long, and they still grumble much like us today. We see God's mercies. We see, uh, this is going to be one of those little points here, so you're just going to have to just hide your toes for me, okay? It just stepped on mine the whole time. But we see it, we know it, but yet we still grumble. But what God does is He says to Moses, I'm going to do something and I'm going to test my people. I'm going to provide for them. I'm going to sustain them because I've heard what they said about it's better to be full in Egypt and slaves than it is in the middle of the desert and starving and free. 
So I've heard what they said. They're not appreciative of what I've done, but guess what? I'm going to do more. And hopefully by this doing more of Moses, they will trust in my sufficient power and my sufficient provision, and they'll abide by me and my law. So that's what a little backstory of that. And I wonder how many times, though, God says that about us. I'm going to send this test their way, but I'm hoping and I'm believing that my people will trust in me to be sufficient. I wonder how many times He looks at you and says, Okay, I know, I know, I know child, this, is gonna, this may sting a little bit. It may look a little dark, but trust me. It's just a test. It's not meant to destroy you. It's meant to grow you. But just trust in me. And I wonder how many times we look at it and we grumble to God like, are you kidding me? But the very thing we've been praying for may be the very test that we just received. The blessing that you've been looking for may be disguised in a package that looks like a valley. But until you get through it, you won't find the blessing. And we got to stop grumbling long enough to realize that God has been sustaining us all the way. And that if it looks like death now, it must be life later. Because God doesn't deal in death, He deals in life. So stop grumbling about what you see before you as something bad and start saying, Hey God, guess what you said in your word? You said you work all things out for good. So this may look bad right now, but there must be something good on the other end. And maybe the blessing I've been looking for, the blessing that I've been praying for, the blessing I've been searching for, may just be on the other side. And sometimes we're just like the Israelites. We'll spend 40 years circling the promise because we won't believe in the promises of God. We'll circle the blessing constantly, day in and day out, day in and day out. And God's like, you can have it if you just believe. But we circle and waste so much time wondering where God is. And God's like, dude, I've been here the whole time. Where have you been? I do it too. Think about it. All those promises in my life I look at, I'm like, man, I could have had them a lot earlier if I'd just been faithful. I have just been obedient. I was circling around the whole time. But we see that they were doing that. So what's the catch about this, though, is you see the quail comes at night, the manna comes in the morning, but there's a catch. I love the catch because the catch reminds us of the sufficiency of God. The catch is they couldn't keep it for the next day. Because if you kept the manna for the next day, it would be spoiled and moldy. Because God said, trust me, I'll provide. Stop trying to hoard it. It will be there tomorrow. And so many of you in here today are, are, are listening to this and you're like, hey, I'm getting it. Because hey, I had to do it. I was like, when I was typing, I was like, hey, I get it. God, I get it. You told me just to, just to stay still and you'll be there. So for the Israelites, they had to realize that, hey, it's going to be there tomorrow. It's going to be there the next day. So I'm going to make my field today of the blessings. And then the next blessing will be tomorrow and it'll be brand new. But I wonder how many of us this morning are living off of yesterday's blessing. I wonder how many of you this morning are living off of yesterday's manna and is moldy and spoiled and rotten and God's trying to give you something new. How many of us are living off of that? How many of us are living off of yesterday's sufficiency simply because we can't trust in the fact that God will provide for us the next day? How many of us are living off that moldy blessing? You want the blessing, but you don't want the work. You don't want the trust. So you hoard it and keep it there tight to your chest because you don't want to see it go nowhere. But God's like, I got a new mercy, a new grace every single day. Just trust me. Eat your fill and move on. I'll be there for the next day to fill you again. See, that's the thing about God is He's constantly filling His people. He's constantly filling you not to hoard the blessings, but to get you to go out and show someone else about them, but also to rely on Him to continue to fill you each day. You see, when we fill a pot full of water, we only fill that one vessel for another vessel. But God's a vessel that always fills a vessel continuously. See, He never runs out. He's filling vessels continuously with living water to spew out. Out of your belly comes living water so that you could go out and do something for God. But too many of us are living off of yesterday's blessings and we're cutting off the supply. We're cutting off our own supply simply because we won't believe in God to be the next time. So, you know that blessing that you get that's just enough to get you to the next week? but not fully commit. That blessing you get that gets you to the next Sunday, and as long as you get to the next Sunday, you're good, you won't commit daily. It's that kind of blessing that you're living off. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're saying you shouldn't use blessings so, so, so loosely, but blessings can look like totally different things to everybody. My blessing is simply getting up every day when your blessing may be healing. There's still blessings from an all-sufficient God. But whatever your blessing is, you may be living off of it. It may be coming in here and getting your battery filled, and then you go out and forget who he is until next Sunday. And you live off that moldy, spoiled blessing when you could have something so much far greater. Let me give you an example. 
Um, real quick, I was going to move down the stage, but I want, I want to be able to keep it on YouTube. But you walk in to church. Okay, so this is you walking into church, and you're like, oh, I'm here at church. I wish I had the other mic, but my ears are too small. It keeps falling off. But you praise. You know how John Chris says different people praise, have you praise, whatever, whatever it may look like. You know. <laughs> but you come in here, you praise, you get your praise on, and you sit down, and hopefully you get into it with the pastor because we love it when you get into it with us. And it makes us go a lot faster, just a side note, because we'll just get a little more excited and talk a lot faster, and then we'll move a little bit quicker, that kind of thing. But anyway, you get into it. You may take notes. You may not take notes. And you'll leave, and you'll be like, man, I'm good. And then you'll, you'll do this. You'll walk out the door. you say, see you, God, next week, next same time, right? And you'll walk out and go the rest of your way. And then you'll come in next Sunday, and you're dragging your feet. You're like, oh. This is much like I was when I was running with Jeremy. Oh. Woo. God, I'm so glad to be here. And I'm glad that many people feel that way. Many of you come in here like, God, I need more of you when you've had him all week. That's great. I need him too. But some of you are coming in here like spiritually exhausted. Whew. God, I need you. And he's like, it's funny. You didn't need me Monday through Saturday. Oh, I'm tired. And you come in and he's like, I had a fresh blessing and anointing for you Monday through Saturday, but you still lived off the spoiled one and wondered why it didn't sufficiently provide for you through the rest of the week. So you come in, and you hoard up, and you leave and do the same thing. And you may come to Wednesday night. You may not because you know Wednesday night ain't that important. We don't do praise and worship, so it must not be important. So we must not commit any more time to God. One and a half hours is enough. God forbid we give any more time to you. And then you wonder why things never change. Because you're changing nothing about your faith. Faith is a changing process. And until you allow that changing to happen, nothing in your life will completely be different. Because what my God says is, you're new when you become a Christian. I have this whole baptism thing, death to life. So if I'm new, then new habits must be formed. If I'm truly new, new things should be happening. So we need to begin to have a faith that says, Sunday's over with, great. Icing on the top. Monday, here comes. I'll praise you, worship you, read about you, do whatever I need to do, have prayer with you. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, come back and we're good. Like, yeah, yeah, God, whoo. And we're not spiritually tired anymore. But then some of you are probably thinking what I did when I was writing this. Having a perfect, great relationship with God Monday through Sunday, will that constitute a, a life full of pleasure and no pain? No, it won't. Just because you have a great relationship and you actually come Sundays, Wednesdays, and you read in between and you praise in between, you worship in between, and worship's more than just what we do in here. It's what you do daily. That's the right and true worship. It's living as a sacrifice daily. So we, we, we do that, and we get a, and then something comes our way, and we're like, God, I did all this stuff. I finally came in and did more than just come and leave you. I actually took you with me, but why am I still seeing these storms? And God's like, because I'm growing you. But the great thing about having a day-to-day -day relationship with God is that when those storms and those problems come, guess what you have? A rest and an assurance of a God who's all-providing and all-sustaining. You know that when you go to Him and you enter in as a child of God, because He's... Because that's, oh, I love it. That's this why the Old Testament is just as important as the New Testament. We are the living temples of God where the, the, the God resides within us. The fire that was once in the temple physically is now inside of us spiritually. That we can walk in and we can say, God, man, I, things are going rough, and He'll listen. God... I already know you know, but I want to talk to you. See, we have the assurance in knowing with a day-in-day -day walk with God that He will listen and He will sustain and He will provide and He will always come to, to His promises and make sure that they are fulfilled. Whether that is right then or ten years later, we know because we have confidence in what we do every day. You know how you get stronger in the gym? You work out all the time. And then before you know it, the ten pounds becomes a hundred pounds. But you've got to learn to take on a little bit more. And what's the great thing about God is when you feel like, and that's, there's a whole debate. I know some people have told me before, that's not in the Bible, that's not this, but it is. When he says that uh, he'll put nothing on you that you can't handle, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not biblical. God puts on you more than you could take. Because if he did put on you more, if he put on you just what you could take, what need would there be for God? So he puts on you more so that you'll run to him and say, here you go, God. I trust you. And then when you trust him and give him that weight that you couldn't carry, you begin to build trust and faith in a God who is sufficient for every need you come in contact with. 
He is sufficient. And when you go before Him and He says, guess what? You were faithful with the small, now I will make you faithful with the large thing. You had went through this valley and, and you came out on the other side and you learned and I'm ready to grow you again. And I love, to say, I love to kind of try to make in my mind the notion to say if something comes my way, God must want me to be bigger and better about something for somebody else or for myself. So when I see another valley come, I see another opportunity to come. It's all about how you look at it. It's all about how you speak it. If you see that valley or that mountain come, you need to start saying, hey, there's just another opportunity for my, great, my faith to grow. And if my faith's growing, that means everybody around me will get to see it and I'll be an inspiration to other people for the glory of God, not for myself. So we've got to refocus sometimes on that stuff too. So the manna, the manna is not there or provided your daily bread for you to hoard up and, do, and just keep it there, hoping that it will be okay to the next time you come. God is sufficient for everything. And when the mountain looks so big and so tall that you can't do nothing, He's sufficient to either get you over it, through it, or under it, or move it completely out of the way. But you've got to trust in Him daily. You've got to understand that when He provides something for you that seems like it's too big for you, that He's big enough to supply, to get you through it, and to teach you what you need to know about it. Maybe the reason you forgot the all-sufficiency of God and you don't feel them anymore, and you don't see them anymore, it's because you don't have a full-time relationship with them. You, could trust in the all, you can't trust in the all-sufficiency of God until you have Him supply your daily needs every single day. The only way to learn that something's sufficient is for you to trust in it to be sufficient. It's a simple notion. But if you trust in it to be there every day, then you'll build that trust for it to always be there. So that's the same thing with that. It has to, it's a full-time relationship, full-time commitment. The Israelites got manna, but they still hoarded it up. And even on the sixth day, God said you're not to do anything on the seventh day. So he provided enough for them on the sixth day to get them to Monday. But still, many of them went out looking on Sunday for the manna. And God's like, what not, didn't I supply you last week? Didn't I supply you last week? So some of us has got to get onto that. So are you still, list, uh, are you still living off of last week's manna? Or are you still living off of last year's conference Last week's worship experience, whatever it may be. Are you still living off of that? Are you still living off of what is supposed to have just been for that day and not accepting what God is wanting to give you for this day? The issue is that, issue is that we don't trust in the sufficiency of God and also sustain love and provision for our lives to be enough to allow Him to be all we need. Until we trust in all those things, we'll never trust in Him to be all we need. He is your daily bread. He is all you need. And is He sufficient? Of course He is. Of course He is. So what are you going to do? Are you going to keep hoarding up this? I, I know it's a great experience. I love coming in here and seeing you every week. I, I, I do. But are you going to hoard up this and not allow God to give you what He wants for you Monday? And miss out on that Monday? And then same thing on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and then come back in here and you're drained again? I'd rather go through life having God sufficiently providing for me every step of the way and face problems knowing that He's with me than face that problem wondering where He's at. So the last thing is this. So we have seen Jesus already said and given us all we need to go. He's given us everything that we need to answer the go. And by answering the go, we, found the, we find the provision, we find the sustainment, and we find that He is sufficient. We have seen that the manna teaches us reliance on God daily and that we need a daily relationship with Him for those new blessings that are every single day and accept that and stop hoarding. We've seen that. But now lastly, I want to look at the confidence that is found within the only prayer in Proverbs. Proverbs is an amazing book of the Bible. I used to take it for granted until I really took it for like serious and started reading what it really was trying to do. And it's a wisdom literature. But throughout Proverbs, we only find one prayer, and it's locked into these verses, Proverbs 37 through 9. And I, and I love this prayer that we find here with this author. And we're going to only focus on one verse, but I want you to see the whole thing of this prayer. He says this, Two things I ask of you. Deny, uh, deny me, them not to me before I die. Remove from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be fool and deny you and say, who is God? In other words, unless you go off and think that you can supply yourself and that he gives you too much to where you don't rely on him anymore. And he goes on to say this. Or at least I be poor and still and profane your name of my God, the name of my God. In other words, unless you stop 
believing in what he says he is and go off and do something that's against him. So it's a powerful prayer that's wedged into this already powerful uh, chapter. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me only the food that is evil for me today. That is the verse I want to focus on for this last point. Let me go ahead and put it up behind me. It's uh, actually 8b. Uh, the NIV says it this way. Give me only my daily bread. Sound familiar? We just talked about it with the manna, the daily provision of the Israelites. But for this point, I want to tie together the first two points into the confidence that we find in this prayer. I want to tie all it together with this confidence we find in this prayer. This prayer that asked just for what the author needed, nothing more and nothing less. And I wonder how many of us this morning could actually pray this and be sincere about it. In a world full of telling you, hey, you've got to have this to be successful. You've got to do this to have worth. You've got to have this car, these shoes, that, this, that, whatever. That they, they show you what constitutes worth as worldly. I wonder how many of us can pray this sincerely and say, God, just give me what I need. Not only the riches. I don't want poverty, but just give me what I need. Sustain me daily with what I need. This prayer is a prayer that will make you refocus what you think constitutes worth. Because I think sometimes not only do we constitute worth physically, but spiritually totally wrong. Some of you walk in here and you feel like you're of no worth whatsoever to anything. Because you've allowed so many other things constitute what God's supposed to tell you what's true. God said that you are worth more than anything in this world, enough for me to send my son to die for you. And that worth, that worth right there is priceless. And many of you are walking around like you're worth two bucks and 50 cents, uh, nothing. And you're allowing everything else to constitute your worth instead of God. And God's trying to tell you, you're worth more than diamonds, you're worth more than pearls, you're worth more than anything in this world. I died for you so that you could come to know me forever and live with me forever and be with me forever. That's how much I loved you. And so many times we're allowing too many wrong things constitute our worth. So I wonder how many of us can pray, God, I don't need the riches of this world. God, I just need you. God, I, I don't, I, just give me what I need. Give me what I need to be sustained to do what you've placed me on this earth to do because you are not you're, you're, you've got to fill the void in this earth you alone for what God's placed you here for and until you do that there's something missing in this earth until you step into that and that's what God says you are to do that's the worth that you have for somebody out there that needs you to be who you are so because if, if we pray this and we mean it we can begin to take hold of the truth that we may have forgotten that God is sufficient God is sufficient. This prayer will cause you to evaluate everything in your life that what you thought mattered. This prayer will cause you to be okay with being rich in, the, in God and not in the world. Because the things that are here on this earth will fade away. You will not take them with you. I'd rather store up things in heaven that I will get than stuff that I will never receive that I'll have for the children that I have one day that they'll get. And I'm hoping that the legacy that I leave behind is enough of a legacy that says of God and not of the world that they have something to hinge their faith on. Not that they'll live off of my faith, but that they'll see through my faith that they can do everything they need to do. This is what this prayer will do. I know it's hard. I want things all the time. Just ask my wife. I, I got a laundry list of wants. I, I mean, it, it ranges from outdoor stuff to Star Wars stuff, in between. I love... I, I, that's just what. I, that's just me. I got a want for every every little bullet note in my mind. What I like, I got a want beside it. But wants are okay. And many of you are like thinking of that verse in the Bible that says He'll give you the desires of your heart. And yes, He will, as long as the desires line with Him. See, oftentimes we take the word and we're like, "Oh God, give me the desires of my heart. I want that new car." And God's like, "That ain't aligning with what I got for you. I want you to ride in the the beat up beat up, beat up Pinto, excuse me, for a little while longer." before I give you anything greater because you're not being responsible with it. So how in the world are you going to be responsible with that? So just because he says he'll give you the desires of your heart don't mean that every little thing that you think about is going to be yours. It has to align with him. So it's okay to want things. I want you to hear this. It's okay to want things until the want becomes the idol you chase at the expense of your relationship with God and what he desires for you. I'm going to say that again because, because I, I think sometimes we, we're, we're mixing the wants up like we, like we do so many times with every good gift that God gives us. We just turn it around for bad sometimes. But wants are not, that, but wants are not bad. But what happens is they're okay until they become the thing 
the idol that you chase at the expense of your relationship with God and what He desires for you. This prayer puts in perspective the things that truly matter in life. This prayer puts in perspective the things and reminds you of the God that will sustain you. All you have to do is be confident in His sufficiency. It may mean that your vision will have to change for His. It may mean that your plan will have to change for His plan. It may mean that your wants and your desires will have to line up for His. It may mean that the the thought that you had of where things were going to go will have to shift to where He wants you to go. But God has something far greater for you than anything that you could ever work to obtain in this world for. And it takes you having the confidence in who Christ is in your life to be sustaining you throughout the whole process of your life to realize that He is all you need and be confident in the fact of all you need. Until God becomes your center focus, until God becomes your sufficient power, grace, and love, and everything you need in your life, you will always be chasing after something to fill a void that was never meant to be filled until He came into the picture. You've got to trust in that sufficiency of God. You've got to trust in it. God, give me my daily bread. Give me my daily bread. Just what I need, God. I don't need the riches of this world. I only want what you need to give me so I can live out the life that you placed in front of me. I want to go when you say go so that I can find my sustainment along the way. I want to know that you're sufficient and I want to stop living off of yesterday's blessings. I want, to, I want your daily love. I want your daily grace. I want your daily mercy. I want your daily sustainment. I want to know that when I come to a mountain that you're sufficient to move it or get me over it. I want to know that when I come to a valley you're sufficient for me to get through it to the other side to learn what I need to learn. And I want to know that you're sufficient enough that when I face a Red Sea with enemies pressing behind me and I don't know what I'm going to do, that you'll open them up and I'll walk across on dry land. I want to know your sufficiency, God. So teach me my, your sufficiency by providing for me daily and allowing me to be confident in your daily su- sufficiency. I want to know the sufficiency of God. What about you? Do you want to really truly trust and know in the sufficiency of God? Do you really truly want to trust in that? I want to know it. I want to trust in it. I want to live in it. I want to show it to others by the way that I live and the words that I speak. I want to know the confidence found in it. I want to know that. So don't give me riches. I don't need it. Don't give me poverty. I just need what I want. I just need what you want from me, God. What you want from me daily. That's what I need, God. This is the confidence, church. That is the confidence of the sufficiency of God. In knowing that whenever He says go, He's sufficient to get you there. That in every day process of your life, He's sufficient to get you through it. And then when you pray this prayer, you'll find confidence in those two things. That when He sends me, I'm good. And when He tells me to stay, I'm good. Or if He provides for me daily, I'm good. Whatever it may be, that He is sufficient in all He does. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Bud Womack from Life Point Church here in America's Georgia. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us today in this worship experience. Our prayer is that the message you've heard is relevant for your life and for today, and also that it builds the body of Christ as a whole. We'd like for you to go to our YouTube channel, click on subscribe, so that you can be a part of the next messages that come out. We'd also like to give you the opportunity to be a part of Life Point Church as we continue to point people to abundant life. If you'd like to give and help support this ministry, go to our website, www.lifepointamericas.com. Click on the Give button, and you'll be able to follow the steps to support this ministry.